I want to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, if you would, please. I'm excited I get to preach a Christmas message. And uh, for us, for at our house, Christmas goes from now until about February. It's when the tree will come back down. And uh, you say, do you love Christmas, brother? How absolutely. How many trees do you have in your house? Um, usually we have six up. Six Christmas trees. I'll explain how that works. Um, we always cut down a real now. This year's a little bit different because of the process of kind of moving a little bit, but we always cut down one on the day after Thanksgiving, and that's the main Christmas tree. And um, that one, my wife decorates with nice, bright white lights, and it's really elegant and really nice. And then there's my Christmas tree that's also about a six, six and a half foot or seven foot tree, and that's decorated with the colored lights. Okay, and like every ugly ornament known to man, that's on my tree right there. And uh, never the two trees do they meet, my wife's and my and my. And my tree, and we have def different views on what a Christmas tree should look like. Okay, and uh, if you believe it should be white lights and very elegant, then uh, you know, then fooey on you. Um, you don't really love Christmas, and uh, because when Jesus was born, there were colored lights everywhere, blue and red and yellow all around the manger. I know it. They're LEDs. Uh, they brought them battery powered, and then. Uh, all, there's, a, there's a light in every single, or a Christmas tree in every single bedroom, one in ours, and the boys and the girls, they get to, and then uh, there's one on the front porch as well, just in case you didn't know it was Christmas time, and uh, that's Christmas at our house, and we sure enjoy Christmas time, and just all the festivities, and just uh, the Christmas music, and just, but, but we come to Christmas time, and of course I'm going to preach on this idea of Christmas this morning, obviously that's where we're going here, as you can get that, and I want to talk about this morning, if I can, about reactions, I want to talk about reactions. You know we all have reactions in life. Someone cuts you off in, in a car and you react. Sometimes not so Christian-like. Hopefully in the spirit. Hopefully you say, well, you know what? Praise the Lord. I didn't need to get there this early anyway. I can delay. You get stopped by a train. You react. You don't say, wow, you know what? Praise the Lord, live in America where there's free commerce and things are going somewhere else. This is great. You're like, man, are these trains even legal? I've been sitting here three and a half minutes. I'm going to call the county, let them know anything about their trains. But we react, and when we started the school year, we did a different thing with band, and, and uh, my son Johnny is, is playing trombone this year. It's his first year playing trombone. And as we're getting ready for the, for the school year to start, he kept on telling me, he goes, Daddy, you know, I need a trombone, and, and I knew this, okay, but I was, I was getting him a, a, a trombone. Obviously, I play trombone, and so I was kind of particular about the trombone that he would play, and so we found a great deal in one night, and I bought him a trombone. But Johnny didn't know this, okay? And so going into it, he talked to, you know, his teacher, to his music teacher, and he's like, you know, my dad, you know, doesn't really know I need a trombone. Talked to Doreen, didn't really know I need a trombone. And, and basically he's saying, my dad's a deadbeat. Okay? It's just, you can ask him, and he's like, I don't know if my dad knows this. You know, he's not real smart. You know, he didn't say that, but that's what he acted like. So it finally, and we got delayed in the shipping. I bought it, I don't know, from China, whatever I got this trombone from. I showed up in my office, and I called him down in the office about the second day of school, I think it was, honey, or something like that, and I, t I filmed it on my phone and set my phone in the corner, and I, I said, Johnny, you know, why are you down here? And I thought he was in trouble, you know, like, Dad's, come on, you, come on, come on, Dad's, you ever pull that trick on your kids like they're in trouble when it's actually it's a surprise? Am I the only one? <laughs> okay. All right, I'm out here, I'll by myself out here, okay, I get it, I get it. Uh, but he's like, you know, his face gets that little, like, ah, oh, no, no, Dad, I said, well, and I showed him the box, and his reaction was priceless. I mean, he's screaming like a little girl. Oh, you kid! Oh, wow, wow, it's so beautiful. Reactions. Reactions. Miss uh, Katie Clark, I see her over there. Good to see you, John Katie. Katie's pregnant. In a few weeks, she's going to have a baby. Lord willing. My sister just had a baby. I think they're watching this morning. There's reactions when you have a baby, isn't there? Good reactions. I remember our first, second, and third child, and it's, it's a blessing. It's a relief, all right? And then the fun begins, and we love it. But you know, you don't have a baby. My wife didn't have a baby, little Johnny, when he was born, and say, oh, man, oh, I got Johnny, oh. No, oh, what a bombs do. Oh, look at this little thing. It's beautiful. No, it's not really, okay? It's, babies are ugly, okay? Things only a mother can love. And listen, if you come to me and say, isn't my baby cute? I'll say, oh, I'm sure you're happy. That's exciting for you. Um, <laughs> but, but eventually they become cute, all right? Listen, moms, don't get all mad at me. I had kids as well, okay? And, and they're, all, they're all ugly. And, um, 
But moms are like, oh, look at this. It's the cutest little thing ever. And oh, you know, they show the nurses. And the nurses are wonderful at the hospital, aren't they? They must say the same thing a hundred times. Oh, wow, that's so precious. Oh, look at the cute little cheeks. But they go from room to room to room to room to room saying the same thing. All right? But the reaction is priceless. It's wonderful. It's moving. And then we come to Christmas time when we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And maybe you didn't notice, but in America in 2018, almost 2019, there is an attack on Christianity. All right? It is not just whatever happens. There's an attack on what we believe. There's an attack on Christmas, because it, but it's not a surprise because Jesus said, listen, don't be surprised when the world hates you. It hated me. It hated me first before you even showed up. All right, so it's not like it's a surprise that the world doesn't like Jesus and Christmas or right, that they want to say happy holidays or happy Xmas. Don't be surprised by that. Jesus said this, this has happened, and that's, and that's the smallest of things, okay? But there's reactions to the birth of Jesus Christ. As I look in Matthew chapter 2, and I don't know if I'll get through all of it this morning. I have two different reactions I want to preach on today. I may only get to one particular uh, people, and that's the wise men. We're going to start there. And in Matthew chapter 2, we see the reaction of the wise men to the birth of Jesus Christ. And I believe there are some lessons from what they did that will help us react the right way to the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is not just any other birth. I am so thankful and so blessed to have three wonderful children. You're all blessed. Children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward, right? They're a blessing from God. All children are a blessing from God. But this particular birth, the birth of our Savior, is the biggest blessing we can ever receive. Because without Jesus coming, there would be no salvation. There would be no eternal life with God in heaven without Jesus coming to earth. Without this birth, our lives, what we do here, is meaningless. It's empty. So this birth is by far, without comparison, the most important birth in all of creation, in all of history, this birth right here. What is our reaction to it? Is it to set up more Christmas trees? And I'm happy to set up lots of Christmas trees, as you know. Look around here, there's plenty of Christmas trees up there, 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 right? Is it just to buy presents and I'm happy to buy presents? No, it's about something much greater. And we'll say things like this, remember the reason for the season. But doesn't it seem like it kind of sells it kind of short? Doesn't it? We'll say things like, well, you know, spend extra time with God over, over this Christmas, Christmas time. And we ought to. But doesn't it seem that if we're not careful, we kind of just minimize the impact that Christ had? So I want to look at this morning and this evening reactions to the birth of Jesus Christ. I don't know how far we'll get. I got plenty of notes to go forever. But I, I was excited when I was studying to find out how they reacted. In Matthew chapter 2, verse number 1, the Bible says, Now when Jesus was born. That's how I knew it was Jesus' birth. You see that? Everybody look at that with me. Now when Jesus was born. It's on the screen or in your Bible. You see that? That's how we knew Jesus was born because the Bible tells us. We can believe it. We can trust. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also, when they, heard the, when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they had saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And they were come into the house. They saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened the treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. 
Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus, the word. Lord, I pray and ask now that you'd help us these next few minutes. Lord, help our hearts to be tender to your word, your truth. Lord, would you challenge, convict, and correct us. May we respond to the way that we ought to respond to honor you, your truth, in Jesus' name, amen. We have the wise men, and there are some misconceptions about the wise men, though most of us don't have these misconceptions. And often at a nativity scene, you'll see three wise men at, at the manger with Jesus. And of course, we know from this passage that the wise men weren't at the manger with Jesus and Mary and Joseph. All right, They weren't there. They didn't get there in time. We often see three um, illustrated in pictures and in the nativity set only because of the gifts, gold, frankincense, frankincense and myrrh. We don't know how many there were. In fact, I would argue, looking at this and some of the things, that there were many more wise men. These are just the gifts they brought because they symbolize some very special things. And if we get to this morning or tonight, what they brought to, to Jesus to worship him. Uh, so history tells us that their names might have been Casper, Melchior, and Balthasar. Now, we don't know that. We don't know what their names were. And, I, and I'm glad the scripture didn't tell us who they were. Tells us these were, the, they, they, they were these men. We don't actually know exactly where they were from. I would say this, though, that as I read about the wise men, I notice four different things, that they were diligent, selfless, faithful, and generous. They were diligent, selfless, faithful, and generous. These men, as we look through the Scripture passage, we'll see some attributes just in the brief snippet we get. Right? They're not talked about hardly in other places in Scripture. I think, I think there's one other place we maybe identify this particular group. But what a unique group of men who, re who reacted and responded to the birth of Jesus Christ. Forever recorded, forever, because thy word is held in heaven, O Lord, so forever these wise men will be spoken about, forever. These particular group of men who reacted and responded to the birth of Christ. I'd give you first, I'd submit this morning that first of all, they were developed in their wisdom. They were developed in their wisdom. The Bible calls them wise men. Now, obviously, we know that, and we know that to be wise uh, would be someone, we would say that would be intelligent, would we not? But if someone were wise, they would probably excel in study, would they not? I mean, you wouldn't say someone who flunks every subject is a wise person. You wouldn't say someone who makes bad investments and loses all their money, wow, they're really wise with their money, wow, that's great, would, would we? If someone were prosperous, we, we might say they're wise financially. If they excel maybe at work, we'd say they're wise in a business sense. And, and the Bible calls these men wise men. The word there is magi. Possibly our word magician comes from it. And the first mentioned, this first group of magicians are possibly mentioned in Daniel. Where the wise men, the magicians, could not determine the dream, but Daniel did. And these group of wise men, why, why I believe they're developed in their wisdom is the first thing that I believe that they, it was a wisdom that was studied. A wisdom that was studied. In Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, I think they might have that verse for the screen, it says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheph. Everybody see that verse? Look at it. Do you see the word star there? Yes? Everybody see the word star? Can you identify that word? Put it in glasses if you can. Everybody see that? Shake him or rattle him. Okay. Now this is the verse that was fulfillment of the prophecy. This is the verse that caused them when they saw something in the heavens, we'll talk about that maybe tonight or later on in the sermon, that caused them to pack up everything and leave. This verse right here. Now look at that verse again and tell me if you saw that verse. You read that verse in your Bible, and you saw something in the sky. They say, you know what? Let's go. Let's go. We're out of here. That verse right there, that's the fulfillment. Numbers 24, 17, fulfillment of the prophecy. Now, to know where that verse falls in context requires diligent study. Does it not? Yes or no? I think most of us, if we had read that verse, even now as casual readers, you probably didn't even know that that was possibly the verse that, that they saw as fulfillment of the prophecy. And you've had a completed scripture your whole life. 
They had these scriptures and they were diligent in their studies. They were developed in their wisdom. Why I believe it was Daniel is many scholars believe that Daniel introduced these truths. You see, the other part of the fulfillment of the prophecy was Daniel's 70 weeks. And in week 69, there's a Messiah that's going to be born. And Daniel prophesied that in Daniel chapter 7. And these men knew the scriptures. They studied the scriptures so that when they believed the child was born, they said, that's it, we're gone. This did not happen just from casual reading. This was just not a cursory glance at the, at the documents or the scriptures and, and saying, oh, okay. This, call, this was a commitment here. There was a diligence that I see in their study that I think should challenge you and I and drive us to our scriptures. Why should these wise men have more study? We have more scripture than they had. We have more access to tools than they had. You can very quickly Google answers to questions and find, by and large, helpful answers to your questions. And yet at a time when we have more access, more scripture, all right, we have the complete scripture now, could we not say that we're probably weaker Christians now? Weaker followers? Could we not say at a time when we ought to be stronger that we're weaker? When they saw this in the sky they said, you know what, that's fulfillment of Numbers 24, 17. That's fulfillment of Daniel 7, verse 13. Boys, pack up the camels. We're going on a road trip. Because they were studied. There's a wisdom that was steady. A wisdom that was steady. We don't know where these men were from. But I think we have a pretty good idea. You see, their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, were from the Persia, Arabia area. It says they were come from the east, so we know it wasn't from the west, all right? And with that, we think they were either from Babylon to where present-day Iran is, somewhere in that, anywhere from 600 to 800 miles away. Most people believe that they were taught and began when Daniel was there in, in Babylon, that he began to teach and prophesy. And that would have been around 480 plus years, 460, at least 460, 75 years earlier. So most likely over 400 years, over 400 years, this group of men, not the same men obviously, were, were diligent and steady in their study. And they were watching for this occurrence. And that, you know what, some of the men probably lived and died never seeing the fulfillment. And saying, but it's coming, but it's coming, but it's coming. There was a faith and belief there. So when I look at these wise men, even before, when, they, when they see that Christ was born, I see a steadiness that should be an example to you and to me. At a time that we have more scripture than Christ, we know when he was born and where he was born and how he was born. Not only is there, is there less study of the scripture, can we not say there's less steadiness to the scripture? Is it not a temptation for us as Christians to, to not hold the scripture as, as steady, as solid? But it should drive us, the birth of Christ should drive us to hold fast the word of truth, to hold fast the doctrines, to hold fast what God has taught us and has shown us. Say, listen, this is what I believe, this is what I will do, this is how I will live. And I might not see the end of God's promises, but I know them to be true. I may not see the end that I want to see today because it may be coming down the road, but I know them to be true. When John wrote the book of Revelations, he did not get to see the fulfillment of those things, but he knew them to be true. And we as Christians know these things to be true. I think obviously you can see the application from this particular point for us. Paul says to Timothy, study to show thyself approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Well, they studied scriptures, and I wonder how much we memorize scripture. If you lost your Bible today, how long could you go on without it? Could you teach someone else the scriptures? Do you hold them dear? The wise men applied themselves, and I wonder if I grabbed a blank piece of paper and said, okay, write out all of the verses you know. I wonder how long that list would be. I wonder if you say, you know what, I've hit it in my heart. I, I wonder if you'd start to string verses together. We do that sometimes as Christians, don't we? We begin one, end it with another, and add a third in the middle. We can talk like the King James, add a couple of V's, thou's, and, and it's. 
But I see from the wise men, I see a diligence in their study. I see a steadiness in their study. When was the last time you dug into the scriptures? I teach the senior Bible, junior senior Bible class, and I, I tell the students this, this Bible, and not to, not to demean it, but this Bible is a really cool book. All right, it's the word of God, it's holy, but it is cool. There are so many amazing things in this book right here. It's alive and powerful, and I read it in the morning, I'm like, man, that is cool. I was reading, I think it was two days ago, about the Apostle Paul. He's on the ship, and, uh, and, and the angel came to him and said, don't worry, Paul, you're not going to lose anybody. And, he, and the Bible says, as Paul says, and I believed God. I believed God. Now, that's going to be a sermon, just so you know, later on. When I get there, I act surprised. But that's a good phrase, I believe God, isn't it? I, ought we not to believe God? You read about this, you read about the beginning of the world, and it's cool. You read how God fought for his people, the children of Israel, and it's really cool. He says, I'll use hornets. I'll use hornets to fight for you. That's cool. Can you imagine a swarm of hornets big enough to take out an army? You see this black crowd and hear this buzzing sound? Listen, I don't care about even your grown men. You hear that many hornets buzzing, you're, and, and hornets are nasty creatures. You know, bees, they sting you, they die. Honeybees and, and ground bees, you got to kind of irritate them. Wasps and hornets, they'll sting you just because they don't like you. And God says, I'll use the hornets for you. He uses a mirage one time. They look down, they see the water, and it looks like blood. And they run away. Oh, my goodness, the, the, the blood runs like rivers of waters. We're run out of here. He uses rustling in the winds. Hold, the sun stands still. And that's just to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. And we have this book, and we all have access to it. We can read it every day of our life. When was the last time you did, though? Not just read it. When did you study it? And say, God, teach me today. God, I want to know something about you. Lord, I want to learn about your word, and, and I want to spend more than 30 seconds in it. Lord, I want to hide your, your word in my heart so I don't sin against you. Lord, I want your word to be a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I look at the wise men, and, and they see the birth of Christ. I look at what they had and what they studied and how they responded to it, and it challenges us. It challenges us. You see, their wisdom was developed. They developed in their wisdom. I noticed one other point this morning as I look at the reaction of the wise men. And I see they donated their wealth. I see that they donated their wealth. We find out in this passage, in verse number 11, that by the time the wise men actually find the baby Jesus, he's no longer a baby. The Bible uses these two words, young child. Young child. You see that in the scripture? Young child. What that tells us is Jesus was probably between two and three years old, somewhere in there. That was a word they would have used to, do, to uh, denote this age. So they saw the star in the sky when Jesus was born, and they jumped onto their camels, or most likely camels coming from Persia. I would argue for camels. I think they got that part right in the nativity set. Um, and they traveled probably two, two and a half years. So for two and a half, two, two years, let's just call it a, even two, let's just say that, two years. I mean, if you want to be really ornery and say one and three quarters, we can say that too. All right, they're traveling. Who's paying for this trip? Who's paying? They are, aren't they? It's a long trip. Listen, I want you today to get in your car and start traveling for two years. You're not working anymore now. You're done working. Can you travel for two years? Now, some of you probably can. Some of, well, at rest you can too, but you're not staying in the same nice places. You're sleeping in your car. Then you're pushing your car. They donated their wealth. I see this long trip. They had lodging, they had food, and they had no work during this time because they're traveling to see Jesus. They're traveling to see the baby Jesus, the Messiah, as uh, David calls him, or Daniel calls him, the Son of Man. You know, a lot of us, unfortunately, have to live paycheck to paycheck. We can no more make this trip than we could travel to the moon. But the wise men knew something was happening, and they gave of their wealth to go see Jesus. They gave of what they had to go see the Messiah. I've got a question. How 
much would you give to go see Jesus? How much would you pay? Imagine if we asked that and did a Facebook poll and people would put astronomical numbers on there. I'd sell everything I have to go see Jesus. Would you? I think we would all say that. But how much do we actually give? Well, I'm going somewhere with this. Because I see their long trip and I see their lavish treasure. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These, uh, these gifts were very, very costly. Frankincense, I, I, I found out, comes out of a tree. Like a white gum-like paste out of a tree that they refine down. It's actually mentioned um, in the Old Testament, frankincense, as a sweet incense as, as part of a sacrifice. Very costly. Gold, of course, now is still costly, but, but back in, in those ancient days, very costly. All right, very, uh, a very lavish gift in myrrh. They seemed, if I can say this, they seemed to spare no expense in what they brought to the promised Messiah. They seemed to, to spare no expense. And so my question is not only how far would you travel to go see Jesus, but, but how, how much would you give him if you could take a gift to Jesus today? If you knew that Christ was born and he was in a, in a house or in a manger today or in a hospital, and, and you could go see him, Jesus, how much would you pay to go see him and, and what would you take him? Would you take him a half-eaten donut from Sunday school? I don't think you would. Would you say, you know what? You know what? I, I had these toys that were my kids' toys, and, and I don't use them any longer. My kids are older now, and, and Jesus is now a baby. He's a young child. So I brought you some toys. Jesus, here's some toys that, 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 that my kids played with before. Would you, would you take that to him? Would you say, well, the baby Jesus will need some clothes, and so I got some hand-me-down clothes, and here you go, Jesus. Would you take him hand-me-down clothes? Seriously, would you? I don't think you would. I don't think I would. If they called you and said, listen, Jesus was just born. You can come see him. He needs some clothes. Can you help us out? Well, all of us would say yes, wouldn't, wouldn't we? Where would you go to buy the clothes? Wherever you could. Would you care if they were on sale or not? Yes or no? If it was for Jesus? No. No. I don't think you would. It's for Jesus. Well, what do you need? Give me that one. Give me that one. Give me that one. Give me that one, too. Oh, and, and, you know, throw some of that in there, too. Oh, he'll look great. Give me that right there. You, and you show up there and say, listen, Jesus said he needs some clothes. Here's some clothes. I look at the wise men, and I see this lavish gifts that they, they lavishly just bestowed on the Messiah, the promised Messiah. And we're touched by that. We look at the nativity scene. We, we think of the wise men, and man, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's awesome. Can I turn it a little bit now for us this morning? We have a chance to see Jesus every day of our life through scriptures. We have a chance to meet with him in church three times a week, do we not? Do we not? We have a chance to pray and communicate with Jesus. How often do you travel to see him? Well, Brother Howell, there's a lot of snow out there. I can't make it today. Good thing the wise men weren't hindered by the weather. Well, you know, that the dearest good church is, it's a solid 45 minutes away. Good thing the wise men weren't, weren't hindered by a 45-minute journey. All that church does is ask for money. Good thing the wise men weren't worried about what they gave. Good thing. Well, I don't see why I have to give anyway. Listen, I'm just showing you what the wise men did. They said, here, Jesus, here, here's what I've got. Here's what we've got, and, and we're trying to give you the best that we have. You say, well, do you see that anywhere else illustrated? Sure I do. pastor just preached on it with the widow and the two mites, did he not, for faith-building offering? When he stood there and a widow came in and dropped in all that she had, her whole living she threw in to give it to God. So God, take it. What do we give to our Lord? We come to Christmas time, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. If we're not careful, we become stingy at Christmas time. And I'm not, I'm not trying to preach so we have bigger offerings. All right, hear, hear me, okay? I'm not worried about it yet. Pastor's still in charge. 
right? It's his problem for another few months. But I'm going to challenge us, I think, from the scripture, from the wise men, all right, when they saw the birth of Christ, they said, you know what? It's time, it's time to dig deep. We come to Christmas time, we're not careful. We get stingy because we're buying presents for everybody, but we forget Jesus. We forget Jesus. We forget what he did for us, how, how he gave his life for us. And we can celebrate his birth by our gifts. And I would say often that how we are with our checkbook shows the condition of our heart. Man, you meet some generous people who, who know the right perspective on riches. And the wise men had this. They're just tools. They're just tools. They just help accomplish a purpose. Lord gave them to me, Lord take them away. Job had that perspective as well. And I look at the wise men and I not only see their wisdom and their steadiness, but I see their generosity. They said, there's only one chance, only one chance to see the Messiah. So we're going to make it worth it. Only one life it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, I look at the wise men, and I'm challenged. Lord, I see how they studied, and they applied themselves. Lord, then I see how they gave. And they were not afraid to be spent for you in their journey, their gifts. But I pray that you would help us. Lord, may we love you like we ought to. What I would say, Pastor Al, as you're speaking this morning, I realize that I need to change some of my reactions to the birth of Jesus. Maybe it's toward the scripture, maybe it's in my own giving, what I do. But I need to give, change a reaction. Would you pray for me? Lord, touch my heart this morning. Would you pray for me this morning? There's something I need to do. Amen. Amen. Hands all over. Amen. Well, if there's someone here who would say, you know, Brother Howell, as you were speaking, you talked a couple times about accepting Christ as, as your Savior, and I've never done that before. But as you were speaking, I, I thought about that, and I would like to do that. Would you pray for me when you pray with the others? I've never trusted Christ as my Savior, but would you pray for me? And I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to someone else, but say, you know, Brother how I've never trusted Christ. If I were to die today, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I'd like to be sure, though. Would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand real quick? Put it back down. I'll pray for you, and I'll pray for the others. One who would say, you know, Brother how I'm not perfect, but I have trusted Christ as my Savior. As a testament to that, I'll raise my hand. I trust Christ my Savior, and I know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Would you raise your hand and put it down? Put it up and down. I trusted Christ as my Savior. Amen. 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 I couldn't help but notice that and many of you were honest. I appreciate that. and Trust Christ your Savior. But I noticed that some people didn't raise their hand about wanting to trust Christ and couldn't raise their hand when they said they have trusted Christ, and I appreciate your honesty. I wondered if we could just open the Bible with you in a few moments and show you from the Bible a lady if you're a lady and a man if you're a man and show you from the Bible how God loves you, how Jesus came and died for you. Say, yeah, Brother Howell, I didn't raise my hand earlier, but I'll raise it now. Would you pray for me and pray with the others? I, I not trusted Christ, but I'd like to trust him today. Would you pray for me and pray with the others? Just slip that hand up and slip it back down. I'll acknowledge it. All right, Lord, I pray for this time. Amen. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to respond to you. Lord, may your birth not just be like any other birth in our life. May it be the most important birth. In Jesus' name.